May 30th, 1942, Operation Millennium, RAF Bomber Command's first thousand bomber raid was launched. Its aim was to destroy the city of Cologne by attacking it with a bomber force that was so large and concentrated that the German defenses would be overwhelmed. It was hoped that the level of destruction would be on a sufficiently large scale to undermine German morale to such an extent that they'd be forced to end the war. The Thousand Plan, as it was called, was a significant moment in the conduct of the war. Not only did it force Germany onto a defensive footing for the first time in nearly a decade, it also helped guarantee Bomber Command's survival, as there were many who had already written off the bombing campaign as a waste of resources that could be better deployed elsewhere. Today, the bombing campaign is represented by the Lancaster of the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight, as it is a popular attraction at air shows. But in 1942, Lancasters were only just beginning to make their mark. Many other aircraft types had been used in countless operations from the first day of the war in Europe to the Western Desert and the Far East. During the 1930s, Britain, alarmed by the rise of Hitler, set about re-equipping her armed services after years of neglect. One of the main beneficiaries was Fighter Command of the Royal Air Force, who was tasked with the aerial defense of Britain against attack by waves of bombers. Everybody was afraid of the bomber. But the bomber to Western nations in the interwar years was regarded rather as uh, nuclear weapons are, are regarded today. So awful that war couldn't be contemplated. I mean, this, this was one of the arguments for the development of bomber forces, that if by their development and their ability to attack uh, civilian targets or even worse, politicians, they made war impossible, then the bomber was a good thing. Of course, the problem was that when war actually came, it was discovered that the bomber couldn't couldn't deliver the goods, and in fact didn't deliver the goods until the middle years of the war. So th there were films made in the 30s, um, things to come, which showed civilian populations running along in the streets, screaming and terrified in the shadows of bombers passing overhead. And then there was the, the terrible incident in the, 1936 in the Spanish Civil War at Guernica, when for the first time, a force of bombers destroyed a city or a town. And that threw a tremendous shockwave through people. And there were, had been efforts made to ban the bomber, but it didn't work because you couldn't ban the bomber as a, as a weapon of war without restricting uh, civil aviation. And basically all that a bomber is, is a civil airplane with a bomb bay. The British point of view was that the bomber was the ultimate terror weapon, the invincible means of taking the fight to the heart of the enemy's territory. But with the limited resources available, priority was given to building fighters. During the Battle of Britain, this policy was shown to have been the right one. But it also meant that Britain had little in the way of means to fight back. Wars, after all, are won by attacking and overwhelming the opponent's forces, not by defending well. Thus, RAF Bomber Command was wholly underprepared for war. In 1939, when the war broke out, they were laughably unprepared for the sort of war they actually had to fight. They didn't have enough aircraft. They only had uh, 33 bomber squadrons as opposed to the 55 they should have had. They didn't have the right type of aircraft. They didn't have heavy bombers. They had two engine bombers who simply were inadequately armed to do the job. They didn't have the right technical apparatus to find the targets. They couldn't find, they couldn't find Germany, never mind Essen. Na they didn't have navigators. Navigators weren't introduced until 1941. But other air forces uh, re were really no better. That was the state of bombing, of, of the bomber aircraft, when war broke uh, out, World War broke out in 1939. The Handley Page Harrow is typical of the kind of thinking that prevailed in the run-up to war in the 1930s. In 1934, the Air Ministry specification B-334 ushered in the era of the monoplane bomber for the Royal Air Force. It asked for modern twin-engine designs to replace biplane bombers, such as the Handley Page Hayford and Vickers Virginia. As in keeping with Air Ministry policy, two companies were awarded contracts for what would become very different aircraft. Armstrong Whitworth designed the Whitley, whilst Handley Page came up with the Harrow. The Harrow first equipped number 214 squadron at Feltwell in January 1937. 
Although it was not equipped with them at the time of delivery, the Harrow Mark I had power-operated gun turrets in the nose, tail, and mid-upper positions, which was an advance over current service types. Only 100 Harrows were ordered, with the last example being delivered in December 1937. They were powered by two Bristol Pegasus engines and could carry up to 3,000 pounds of bombs. It had a service ceiling of 22,800 feet. The Harrow was in first-line use until the beginning of 1940, when it was retired to the role of an unarmed transport. However, the Harrow was used in experiments under the codename Pandora. The objective was to drop parachute-suspended explosive charges trailing 2,000 feet of piano wire across the path of raiding Luftwaffe bombers. Operation Mutton, as it was called, continued throughout the Blitz of 1940 to 1941. The experiment was not a great success, accounting for just four or five kills. The Bristol Bombay was similar to the Harrow, in that it too was specified as a bomber and transport. The first production Bombay flew in March 1939 and equipped number 216 squadron in Egypt in September that year, just as war broke out. The Bombay was powered by two Bristol Pegasus radial engines and it had a surface ceiling of 25,000 feet. It could carry up to 2,000 pounds of bombs or 24 troops over 2,000 miles when fitted with wing tanks. With relatively little power and fixed landing gear, the Bombay certainly did not offer high performance. However, the type also offered few problems to its pilots. The combination of flaps and high set wing kept takeoff and landing speeds low. The Bombay could therefore use small, poorly prepared airfields without trouble. This was particularly valuable in North Africa, where they were used as light bombers and transports against the Italians. But as the bomber transport concept became outdated, the Bombays gradually disappeared out of service during the mid-1940s, having achieved all and more than its designer had ever envisaged. The Hamden was essentially a stopgap design between biplane and the eventual heavy bombers. But despite its unusual design, Hamden's represented approximately 25% of Bomber Command's offensive strength by September 1939. And this is the crew of the bomber that scored a direct hit on a cruiser, believed to be the Königsberg, and sank her. It was their second operational flight, the first being their raid on Sioux. Well, hello. Are you glad to get back? Glad. And mighty glad to have had a crack at the German fleet. It wasn't my most popular aircraft. Um, from the pilot's point of view, I think the, the Hamden... Uh, any pilot I spoke to quite enjoyed flying it. It was it was very manoeuvrable. Um, it was only about as wide as your shoulders. Um, it was a difficult aircraft to get into from the point of view of a navigator. You went in down at the back and you climbed up along a tunnel. You went down underneath the pilot and you were in quite an isolated position. Um, the only communication you really had got with the pilot was over the over the intercom. And you sat sideways in the, in the fuselage um, with a wonderful perspex dome. You've got a beautiful view there. Um, but from a point of view of communication, you were entirely reliant on, on intercom. And I must admit, one felt a bit isolated. The type was withdrawn from first line bomber squadrons in September 1942, although it continued in use as a torpedo bomber. Oh, the visibility is very good, yes, and I think this is why they were probably chosen for doing torpedo dropping from the bombing, after the bombing usage. Um, how much they were actually used, I don't know, but um, certainly it was very, particularly flying at sort of 60 feet, which is sort of optimum height for launching a torpedo above the waves. And, but, um, and I like low flying anyway. Very exhilarating. The other bomber to come out of specification B-334, which gave life to the Harrow, was the Armstrong Whitworth Whitley, which was ordered straight into production off the drawing board. Although it was still only a twin-engine bomber, the Whitley was a much more successful aircraft, capable of reaching Berlin. Well, 
one particular raid on the 7th of November 1941, which was to Berlin. Uh, and the trip to Berlin and Whitley on a calm day would be quite a challenge. But um, this was probably one of the worst weather condition nights that um, Bomber Command had certainly experienced at that time. The aircraft from crossing the um, Dutch coast uh, began to ice up. And we had icing all the way to the target and back. Um, chunks of ice, literally chunks, were flying off the air screws and hitting the side of the aircraft. And it was probably more, more frightening than the flak, the, the noise of it all. And then when we got the region of Kiel on the way home over northwest Germany, um, the aircraft iced up to such an extent it, it just dropped uh, from about 12,000 feet down to around about 2,000. Um, engine had stopped. Everything was totally iced up. But we got it going again and crossed the North Sea at, at around 2,000 feet. Uh, we couldn't get back to Yorkshire and we landed at what in those days was Horsham St. Faith. Now, of course, Norwich Airport. Ten Whitleys flew the first operation of the war on the night that war was declared on September the 3rd, 1939. The raid was a leaflet drop over the Ruhr, a target which in those early years was extremely hazardous. Safely returned to their base in France, RAF raiders who have just carried out one of the most remarkable feats of the war. These are the men who did the trick, finally giving the lie to Goering's boast that no enemy planes could ever penetrate far into the right. Loading up with thousands of leaflets, they prepare to set out on their daring raid. The plan being to fly over Bohemia and Austria, involving a flight of over 2,000 miles. This would have been a notable effort in peacetime, but to accomplish it successfully over enemy country in wartime, and in spite of the intense cold of the worst winter for years, it's, well, quite an achievement, isn't it? Mostly, of course, they weren't allowed to attack targets on land. In the early days, they were supposed to attack ships and warships only at sea, or drop mines, or drop leaflets. So there was no real point in those days of, of sending a squadron. It was much better to send a few aircraft to drop leaflets on Mannheim and a few more to drop leaflets on, um, I don't know, Dusseldorf or somewhere. It, it, it was um, the only advantage of dropping leaflets. Harris said it had uh, two advantages. One was it um, gave the crew air experience and uh, they learned a few lessons. And of course, it provided Germany with toilet paper for the full five years of the war. One of the most amazing stories of a strange war concerns this RAF bomber crew who've enjoyed a unique experience and a lucky escape from being made prisoners of war. Returning from a night flight over enemy territory, they actually landed in Germany under the impression that it was France. They spoke to some peasants, one of whom pointed to the west and said, in English, the frontier was about 14 miles away. Getting back into their plane and taking off was a matter of a split second. In fact, I imagine they broke all records. Anyway, they got away with it, and here they are, back at their base, and quite naturally, in the highest spirits. The Whitley remained in frontline service until mid-1942, although individual aircraft took part in sorties right up until 1944. Bit of a long tunnel, that one. I remember getting back to the, the flare chute. Um, if you wanted to drop a flare or... or drop um, leaflets. You had to crawl back through a tunnel over the main spar, um, which was um, when you've got your parachute harness and your May West on, it was a bit of a squeeze, I remember. But um, however, they weren't built for that, weren't built for comfort, but they were all right. I do remember lifting a pilot, uh, my pilot out of um, the Whitley, who'd been there without without an autopilot or anything for 10 hours and he was a tall chap and he was he was very very cramped by the time we landed modified whitley's also played a vital role as transport for the fledgling paratroop force the program included the inspection of a number of paratroops who dropped in at the station the vickers wellington was the most successful of bomber command's aircraft in the early years of the war it was affectionately known as the Wimpy, after a portly cartoon character popular at the time. The crews loved the Wellington because it could sustain a lot of battle damage and still get them home. <laughs> 
The Wellington's robustness was due to its construction method, a lattice of light metal rods called geodetics. Like other bombers of the period, early marks of the Wellington were powered by twin Bristol Pegasus engines. But because of its strong but lightweight construction, it was capable of carrying up to 4,500 pounds of bombs, torpedoes and mines. Wellingtons played a vital role in early operations as Bomber Command struggled to meet many conflicting demands. On the one hand, there were those who realized that bombing was the only means of hitting Germany back. On the other, there were those, particularly within the Admiralty, who felt that if Britain was to avoid starving to death, then the bombing effort needed to be directed towards maritime targets. No need for it. It really came back to resources. Uh, certainly when Britain started to rearm in the middle 30s, from 35 on, after Hitler came to power, the concentration was largely on fighters for local defence. Um, and it was always very clear that one would have to build a, a long-range strategic bomber to attack Germany. But it took time, the money wasn't there, the technical side hadn't been developed. Nobody really had any idea what the, the war would be like. And I've had RAF veterans say to me that, that when we entered the war, we really didn't know what we were doing. And uh, the RAF uh, official history says that the sort of war they engaged in in 1939 was essentially new. So basically, it, it all had to be done again. Either way, it was the young crews who had to carry out their missions using whatever means they could. Well, uh, navigation remained a problem for most of the war. But at the start of the war, uh, it, it was largely based on DR, on, on dead reckoning. Basically, map reading from the air with a compass and a chart or a map, and you attempted to plot your way to the target, uh, which in daylight you could sometimes do. Though, uh, again, uh, the pre-war exercises had revealed that navigation in the RAF was distinctly hit and miss. It was a common practice to fly down low on the ground and see what the name was on the railway station, on the railway side. This was known to the crews as the Bradshaw method after the railway timetable. Uh, they didn't have navigators. Navigators weren't introduced until 1941. It was all left to the pilot. So in about 1939, they introduced two pilots, and the second pilot's job largely was navigation and, and, and later on uh, bomb aiming and bomb dropping. But the state of training uh, typically wasn't there. Well, it certainly taught me that, um, as from a professional point of view, as a navigator, I got to work from the moment I took off till the moment I got back. Um, and never, never miss an opportunity of finding some piece of information that contributed to um, navigation. If I spotted a river that I could ident identify that I was crossing, whether I could identify where I was on that river, never mind, record it, plot it, use it. Maybe use it with a similar observation half an hour later. Every spot of information that would, I say, contribute to my navigation, never miss an opportunity. We're certainly doing the best we could. Uh, as far as I'm personally concerned, I thought we were hitting the target on some occasions. I mean, one reads latterly uh, of the very poor effect of bombing at that time. But one must bear in mind, we had no bombing aids at all. Uh, navigation was dead reckoning and a certain amount of astro navigation. So finding targets in poor weather conditions with very little aids was a challenge to say the least. Having been sent to a, a target inland about the third operation, um, I realized that it was hopeless. The there was a cloud base way below us, solid, with a few little wandering searchlights shining through it, but it was impossible to pick up any, any ground uh, pinpoints at all to hope to reach a target. The only way you, you could do it was to fly certain courses for certain times. And uh, even then, if you couldn't see the target, you did what they told you to do, and that was bring the bombs back. <laughs>
Incidentally, a friend of mine who was uh, at Woodley with me uh, brought back his bombs. Uh, he was flying a Whitley, and uh, on landing he blew up. So it didn't make us too keen to bring bombs back after that. The needs of the Admiralty remained a persistent problem for Bomber Command throughout the war, as it simply did not have aircraft with the kind of endurance and range required by such operations. The problem was exacerbated by the fact that there were not enough aircraft to go around. Thus, extreme measures were sometimes taken. So desperate was the RAF to try and give the Germans a bloody nose. One of the most extreme examples was the use of Tiger Moth trainers to attack U-boats. The idea was taken as far as designing bomb racks for the wings before the plan was scrapped. The crews of the Avro Anson were less fortunate. Although the faithful Annie, as the Anson was christened, was designed as a maritime reconnaissance, trainer and communications aircraft, Ansons were also used in the bombing role. By the outbreak of war, Ansons accounted for 60% of Coastal Command's operational aircraft. And although the Anson would enjoy a spectacular service career, the last Ansons were retired in 1968, they were hopelessly miscast in the bombing role. There's an old lady which waddled along uh, and could take you from A to B, but other than that, I don't think it served any useful purpose uh, once the war had started. Anything which could only carry up a 100-pound AS bomb uh, um, wouldn't do any harm really to a submarine, which is his main target, I suppose. And when it came to dropping it on any land base, it was just putting pilots at risk unnecessary. It's too slow, too fragile, um, in fact, quite useless. And even if you were very exhausted, to have some apparatus that took you 120 turns to get the undercarriage up, because that hadn't been mechanized in those days, uh, just shows you the, the, the fut futility of the aircraft. I mean, no, Anson wasn't in. The first American warplane to see operational service in World War II was the Lockheed Hudson. This was a military derivative of the Model 14 Super Electra Light Civil Transport. The Hudson provided invaluable service as a light bomber and maritime reconnaissance plane at the beginning of the war, but was considered slightly too small for its task. In 1940, therefore, the British Commission from Lockheed, a successor, developed from the larger Model 18 Lodestar civil transport. It was called the Ventura. By comparison with the Hudson, the Ventura had a larger bomb bay, able to accommodate 2,500 pounds of bombs, compared with the Hudson's 1,000 pound bomb load. The Ventura Mark I began to enter Bomber Command service during October 1942. It was powered by two Pratt & Whitney WASP radials, each delivering over 1,800 horsepower. This was soon increased to 2,000 horsepower in the Ventura Mark II with a speed of 300 miles an hour. The Ventura also featured more potent defensive armament than the Hudson in the form of two .303 machine guns in the ventral position and two or four machine guns of the same caliber in a dorsal turret. It also had four nose guns, comprising two fixed weapons of 0.5-inch caliber and two trainable 0.303 guns. Although the Ventura was relatively heavily defended, its performance was indifferent, which made it vulnerable to fighter attack, and so it was withdrawn from bombing operations in 1943. What the RAF needed to fulfill its maritime bombing role effectively were four engined aircraft with the payload and range to inflict substantial damage. British factories were already stretched to the limit producing aircraft, so it was to the United States that the RAF turned for a solution to their problem. The Boeing B-17 has of course achieved legendary status for its role in the United States 8th Air Force daylight bombing campaign. But the first B-17s flew from the United Kingdom in RAF markings in May 1941. 
They were used in high-level bombing sorties by day, but lack of suitable facilities to combat the freezing conditions at high altitude and poor tactics led to the type being withdrawn and reassigned to maritime duties in August 1942. I, again, uh, on a once-only basis, uh, Flying Fortress came to, the, to an airfield called Down Ampney in Gloucestershire one day, and I naturally went up and said, can I have a go at this thing? And he said, well, have you flown any four-engine aircraft? Well, I said, yes, yes, I've flown a Lancaster. Oh, well, that'll be all right, says he. So I step into the, into the first pilot's seat and go off. And now this was a, a lovely aeroplane. It was, it was a very sort of soft, gentle aeroplane. It uh, got off the ground and it sort of sat steady. A lovely bombing platform it would be. And I flew around for about an hour and then came back and landed it. And I was, you know, rather worrying that I might bounce it or something. Not a bit of it. It settled down sort of like a sort of jelly on a, on a thick pile carpet. It was the easiest aeroplane to fly. Well, not the easiest, but one of the easiest aeroplanes I ever flew. For the last year of the war, 100 Group flew flying fortresses in radio countermeasures operations in support of Bomber Command. And significantly in the hours before dawn on D-Day, June the 6th, 1944. But protecting the convoys from submarine attack remained impossible once they were in the middle of the North Atlantic or Indian Ocean and beyond the range of land-based aircraft. The one exception was the consolidated B-24 Liberator. Liberators arrived in RAF service in 1941 and as the VLR, or Very Long Range, variant proved very successful in the war against the U-boats. Almost one-third of Coastal Command's tally of U-boats sunk or crippled was claimed by crews in Liberators. Big things were expected from the Bristol Blenheim, which was the UK's first high-speed tactical bomber when it entered service in 1937. The Blenheim Mark I carried 1,000 pounds of bombs and could reach 285 miles per hour thanks to its two Bristol Mercury radial engines. Production of the Mark I, with its short, unstepped nose, totaled 1,427, built in England and under license in Finland and Yugoslavia. But by 1939, most had been relegated to the Mediterranean theater. In home service, the Mark I was followed by 3,285 examples of the Blenheim Mark IV with the longer step nose. ...has been carrying out carefully planned offensive operations against Germany. Blenheim bombers have played a most successful part in these continuous attacks on military objectives. 700 raids of major importance and every one of them over specially selected targets. Bombs like these have rained down night after night upon Nazi industry and transport, and tremendous damage has been done to those targets. Despite its more powerful engines, it had poorer performance than its predecessor, but possessed greater defensive firepower. It also handled well in the air. But daylight operations at the beginning of World War II confirmed two facts. On the one hand, this light bomber lacked the outright performance to escape German fighters. On the other, it was too poorly protected and armed to battle its way past the fighters. I don't remember many dates, but 12th of August 1941 is indelibly imprinted on my mind because 54 Blenheims were detailed to carry at a low level daylight attack on the two power, sta two power stations at Cologne and my target was the knapsack power station. And, of course, our fighters didn't have the range to give us escort to Cologne. They gave us escort to the Dutch coast, and they turned back, and we flew unescorted, hedge-hopping, all the way to Cologne. And I'll never forget, I've said it before, I say it again, the wonderful reception we've had from the Dutch farm people as we flew over their land at about 50 feet, they went mad waving to us. And that brought home to me very much what the war was all about. They were an occupied country, we weren't. <laughs> 
And uh, I've said before that no one needed to tell, my navigator didn't need to tell me when we crossed the border into Germany because the waving stopped. And uh, we lost uh, 12 out of 54 Blenheims on that raid. But uh, it, to me, uh, was fantastic, dramatic, exciting, first daylight raid by a significant force in Germany. As a fighting airplane, the Blenheim was a nice airplane to fly, smooth, but not damage resistant. Had no self-sealing tanks, uh, and the ones I flying very little armor plate. Uh, the turret faced aft, and right where a fighter would sit behind you was the rudder. And you was not as maneuverable as a fighter. So if you swung it around to try and give the gunner a, sh a shot, the fighter could swing around and remain hidden by the rudder. And you could see him sitting there. You could see the wingtip sticking out both sides and the chap protected completely by the airplane itself, by my airplane. The only way to get away from a fighter was to stand the damn thing on its head and go down to the ground. He couldn't really shoot you if you were pointing vertically towards the ground. And when you got down, you pulled out at the last possible moment and flew very low. And when I say very low, I mean sort of two, three, four feet above the ground. And he couldn't get underneath you. And so it gave your gunner a better shot. To show how low you could fly, a friend of mine actually touched the desert with his prop tips, thereby bending the prop, because they were pulling like crazy on the air. And when they pulled on the sand, they all bent forward. About nine inches of prop bent horizontally forwards and the engine turned over much faster, and the high altitude props worked much better low down, and the aeroplane went faster. We, Benham Squadron Commanders, all wanted to chop the tips off the props, all our props, to take a hacksaw to them, but they wouldn't let us do it. Despite its limitations and losses, though, the Blenheim was important in providing crews with experience in light tactical bombing and close ground support. The re-equipment of the Royal Air Force with new planes is progressing, and the latest edition called the Battle is the fastest bomber in the world. The exact horsepower cannot yet be revealed, but it is stated that the engine possesses greater power than any at present in use in the service. Unlike most bombers, this machine can be thrown about in the air in the same way as the modern fighter. When the Fairy Battle was conceived in 1932, it was a reasonably advanced design with adequate performance. Its first flight was in March 1936, and the battle was subsequently ordered in large numbers. A total of 15 squadrons in RAF Bomber Command were equipped with battles by September 1939. Ten of those squadrons were sent to France as part of the advanced air striking force. When you read of aerial activity on the Western Front, you may be sure that scenes like these accurately illustrate what has been happening. With an almost casual air, men of the RAF set out on a reconnaissance flight over the Siegfried Line and beyond. There seems no doubt that the Allies' men and machines are superior to Germany's. But the battle's light payload of 1,500 pounds, inferior performance and lack of adequate defensive armament, meant that they were obsolete by the time the German onslaught into Western Europe began in May 1940. By June, virtually all of the battle squadrons had been wiped out. After the fall of France, the battle was quickly withdrawn from frontline duties. Although fighter command saved Britain from defeat in the summer of 1940, there was little her armed forces could do to fight back. All three services were stretched to breaking point, defending what was left of her vast empire. In Iraq, Airspeed Oxfords, the aircraft used to train all RAF bomber crews, 
played a decisive part in the battle to save the strategically important base of Habania from being overrun by the pro-German Iraqi regime. I was running the Oxford outfit, 26 airplanes. I said to one chap, take that airplane, go out and bomb those guns on the thing. He came back about two minutes later as I was walking out to my airplane and said, the airplane you wanted me to take says we hit by a shell and it's on fire. What other airplane will I take? Because they were firing all the time and we were working, working off the airfield and it was very frightening indeed. That's when I started smoking. I thought it made me less frightening, less frightened. Uh, the daytime went through and by the evening, 14 hours later, we had lost a quarter of our pilots and a third of our aeroplanes with no possibility of any reinforcements from anywhere. And they hadn't come in, so there was nothing else we could do but to carry on. That night they fired 200 shells into the camp, which of course we couldn't stop. And so the next night we were doing night flying. We couldn't have a flare path, of course, under the noses of the guns. So while the moon was up, they flew the uh, half, the audaxes from a little airfield we'd built inside the camp. And after the moon went down, I and two other pilots I'd selected flew in the pitch dark. Uh, take off in the total black, not even with cabin lights on because you could see them from the ground, and hope that you didn't hit wreckage of an aeroplane on the airfield or the bank, 20-foot bank at the end of the airfield got off, flew around, and once every quarter of an hour you dropped a bomb on the plateau. That kept, they were, if you saw the flash of a gun, you drop a bomb on it. So um, uh, that kept their shelling down very considerably. First night, uh, the warrant officer, one of the people I did, hit the bund at the far end, somersaulted into a marsh at the far end, caught fire, and that was the end of him. The other one was a pilot officer, a uh, flying officer, came in, and he was absolutely shaking like a bloody leaf at the end. And uh, he said, I'm not going to do this again. I'll never do this again. And so that left one character. I did two sorties the following night and one the night after. And believe me, to take off in the pitch black, hoping that you were pointing towards an open area of airfield. And then to come back and fly around over the enemy troops, turn on the landing light at the time when you hoped you were at the beginning of the airfield, slam the thing on the ground, turn off the landing light and keep us straight on the directional gyro and hope you wouldn't run into a crashed airplane on the way. Uh, it was very alarming and I did four of those, and that was enough. Luckily, the Iraqis also had had enough and they fled. They actually came off the plateau and fled for Baghdad. Elsewhere in the Mediterranean theater, it was a case of making do with whatever equipment was available. The Vickers Wellesley was a forerunner of the Wellington in that it used the same method of construction. But by the beginning of World War II, the single-engine Wellesley was obsolete. Some, however, saw limited service against the Italians in North and East Africa during 1940 and 1941. The bombs were carried in streamlined pods under the wings. After 1941, Wellesleys were relegated to a short career of maritime reconnaissance. As in other theatres, the arrival of American-built aircraft in numbers helped significantly to swing the pendulum back in favour of the Allies in the Mediterranean campaign. The origins of the Baltimore four-seat light bomber lie with the same company's XA-22, which was rejected by the US Army Air Corps in 1939 
Adopted by France as the Martin 167F bomber, it was then taken up by the British as the Maryland Reconnaissance Bomber. Serving in the Mediterranean theater from October 1940, the Maryland was initially useful, but soon revealed its limitations in performance. The RAF, therefore, ordered the Baltimore as an improved type. It was powered by two right double cyclone radials. The performance improvements included speeds of up to 300 miles an hour. The bomb load remained unaltered at 2,000 pounds. The new aircraft's defensive armament was upgraded from six machine guns of the Maryland to between 8 and 14 guns in the definitive version of the Baltimore, the Mark III. This machine introduced a power-operated dorsal turret that replaced the manually operated guns of the earlier marks. The new weapons layout was arranged as four fixed guns in the wings, two or four guns in the dorsal turret, as well as two guns in the ventral position, and as an option, four fixed rear-facing guns. The Baltimore's fuselage was made large enough for the crew members to change position something that had been impossible in the Maryland. Over 1,500 Baltimores were built, the vast majority of them being operated by the RAF. In service from January 1942, the Baltimore was successful and popular, even though its bomb load was relatively small. The early marks performed sterling work in the North African desert and Tunisian campaigns, in which the Baltimore operated against the German and Italian ground forces. It also helped in the vital campaign that devastated Axis shipping trying to ferry supplies into North Africa. The Baltimore served with eight British and three South African squadrons in the Mediterranean theater and played an important part in the Sicilian campaign. The type was a major first-line asset in the campaign on the Italian mainland, bombing and at times using its wing guns to strafe tactical targets just in front of the advancing armies. Its speed made the Baltimore difficult to shoot down, and its steady, more potent defensive firepower was another reason why fighter pilots were not keen to engage the type. One of the features of the tactics employed by the Allies during the North African campaigns was the close cooperation between Army and Air Force. In this theater, bombers generally attack targets of tactical significance, as opposed to the strategic bombing campaign being waged in Europe. As the Allies increasingly gained their superiority, tactical operations were flown increasingly against smaller targets in countries occupied by the Nazis. Again, the RAF relied on American-built aircraft to carry out these operations. One of the most successful was the Douglas Boston. The first Mark I's had been delivered to the RAF in mid-1940 and used to convert crews to the tricycle undercarriage. The version most widely used by the RAF was the Mark IV. With 1,600 horsepower engines, it could achieve speeds of 342 miles per hour. It had an armament of 2,600 pounds of bombs and five machine guns, including rear firing guns in the engine nacelles. High performance, first class handling and an overall ruggedness meant that the Boston was a popular aircraft and it remained in service until the end of the war in Europe. Other, newer aircraft designs would also improve Bomber Command's strike capability. For example, the de Havilland Mosquito played a vital role in the target-marking operations flown by the Pathfinder Force formed in 1943. 
unarmed, built of wood, but extremely fast due to the power of its twin Rolls-Royce Merlins. The Mosquito at first found little favor with officialdom due to its unorthodoxy for a military machine. But once it had been deployed on bombing operations in November 1941, there was no stopping the Mosquito, and it became one of the legendary aircraft in aviation history. We had no armament at all in any of the Mosquitoes I flew. You relied on speed, low level, you, you were relying on keeping below the terrain, below the radar, and very difficult at that speed for fighters to attack you. At high level, you, were, uh, had a, you relied on your maneuverability and your height uh, and speed. And um, our losses uh, at the high level operations were dramatically lower than in most other types of operations. Further afield in the Far East, another unusual aircraft was making its mark in RAF hands. The Vulti Vengeance was the RAF's first aircraft specifically designed for dive bombing over the land battlefield. Early on in the Second World War, it was realized that ground attack would play a vital role. But by the time the Vengeance became operational in mid-1943, many of the myths about dive bombers had been rationalized. Thus, the Vengeances were deployed against jungle targets in Burma, where aerial combat was less frequent than in other theaters. Vengeances were built in four main variants with different armament and progressively more powerful engines for a maximum speed of 280 miles per hour. The Vengeance was a substantial two-seater. The pilot controlled a fixed battery of four or six heavy machine guns fixed in the wings for strafing. Despite its size, the Vengeance had straightforward handling characteristics. The brakes on the upper surface of the wings checked diving speed very successfully, and the Vengeance could therefore deliver its weapons with pinpoint accuracy. The Vengeance could carry a 2,000-pound bomb load delivered in a steep dive with the air brakes extended from the wings to control speed. By the end of the first year of war in Europe, Bomber Command had learned some costly lessons. Well, if you, middle of 1941, two years into the war, just, um, not, not too good. They were getting slightly better aircraft. They, they, the Sterling was coming on stream. Uh, the Manchester wasn't very successful. It was around one or two early marks of... Um, uh, Lancaster, and the backbone was, was the Wellington. And the other earlier marks, the Battle, the Hamden, and the Blenheim were being phased out. But there was still this problem. They didn't have enough aircraft. They were always having aircraft filched away to go to the Western Desert in support of the army, to go to Coastal Command to attack U-boats. So there was a terrible problem of trying to get strength up. And losses were still, were still quite high. So th basically, they weren't going anywhere in the middle of 1941. And then, of course, there was the um, famous, I, I think it's famous rather than notorious, Butt Report, which proved pretty conclusively, um, with, with firm evidence, which everybody had suspected, that the bombers were not finding the targets or hitting the targets, that the bomber offensive was basically a failure. But in a way, that was a good thing, because the first way, the thing you have to do before you can solve a problem is accept that you've got it. Stop arguing about, you know, are, is it working or isn't it working? Are we hitting the targets or are we not? No, we're not hitting the targets. Right, let's stop wittering on about that. Let's direct our energies to improving our various aids and aircraft and crew training until we can hit the target. At which moment, of course, they had the greatest asset they ever got, which was Arthur Harris. The biggest problem was accurate navigation uh, deep into Germany particularly under the prevailing um, weather conditions that um, prevailed, for example, in the Ruhr, where at the best of times you went over, there was industrial haze. Um, to a large extent, you were relying on visual identification, uh, both from the point of view of navigation to get there and when you got near, the, near and to the target, and in conditions of deep industrial haze, you'd be looking down and you, you just 
be able to see a small area. No way could you get decent map reading to to identify. Um, and it it was extremely difficult. I mean, that, that didn't prevail 100% of the time, but there, there, there were great difficulties in that. And navigational accuracy, in my view, did not improve until we got the um, hyperbolic AG. Yes, it was deadening, really. You knew that um, you were perhaps uh, close to the target because you'd you navigated as best you could, but um, you knew that uh, within five miles or so you're hopeless. And in fact, um, the most damage we did to the German war effort was killing their cows in the fields around. I, I think it it did um, it did shatter us a bit to to read um, really how. Um, relatively inefficient we we had been i don't think we realized that we were we were getting so few bombs um, close to the target as the butt report suggested but in 1941 raf bomber command began to receive the kind of aircraft it would need if it was to prosecute the war against germany with any kind of effectiveness the first of the four engine heavies to enter operational service was the short Sterling, which equipped Number 7 Squadron RAF in August 1940. A raid carried out at a very low altitude so as to make absolutely certain that the attack should be concentrated on the factories themselves. The type was not a success in the bombing role because of its small and therefore overloaded wing, which had been designed to fit between the maximum door opening of the standard British hangar. It meant that the Sterling's operational ceiling was dangerously restricted, which in turn led to a disproportionate number of casualties among Sterling crews. Oh, yeah. Reconnaissance photographs taken at 400 feet prove the accuracy and and here's another story of gallantry, of the spirit that spells defeat for Hitler. The crew of that Sterling is being told that it's the gift of Lady McRobert, who has lost her three airmen sons. Now, she'd lost three sons, and you, you know, you would have thought a mother would be destroyed by that. Not Lady McRobert. What she did, she sent a check for £25,000 to Sir Archibald Sinclair, who was the Secretary of State for Air, and she told him to buy a Sterling bomber with it, and... Uh, to send it to her son's squadron, 15 squadron, and it was to be called um, Robert's Reply. Uh, they still have, uh, by the way, an aircraft in uh, 15 squadron called McDonald's Reply. She said, um, if I had 10 sons, I know they would have followed the path of duty, and may the blows you strike with her bring us nearer to victory, which I find very effective. Filling the donor's wish on operational flights over Germany teaching a barbarian race that no sacrifice is too big a price to pay for freedom. Mac Roberts' reply is Britain's reply. The Sterling later became an invaluable glider tug and transport for paratroops. The Avro Manchester entered service in November 1940, and though potentially a great bomber, it suffered operationally due to the chronic unreliability of its two Rolls-Royce Vulture engines. Some 40% of the 202 Manchesters delivered were lost on operations, and a further 25% written off in crashes due to technical defects. I found that the Manchester, once you had a, a knack with it, you could do anything with it. Uh, for instance, the the propellers were 16 foot, uh, much, much uh, longer than the Lancasters, uh, so that um, you could leave a trickle of engine on the Manchester, just a slightly faster revs than Tickover, and it would fly rather like an old Anson. And when, when you'd reach the point on the landing run, when you wanted to touch down, just 
knocking the throttles back and she just dropped down on there. And uh... Even before the Manchester entered service, Avro's designers were hard at work seeking an alternative to the mistrusted Vulture engine. They eventually proposed a design powered by four Rolls-Royce Merlin engines, to be known as the Manchester 3. This proposed variant later became the legendary Avro Lancaster. Well, the first uh, thing we knew about the Lancaster was that one of our members came into lunch, having done his night flying test on, on the Manchester, and he said, uh, you won't believe me, fellas, but I've just seen a Manchester with four engines. And uh, this was the uh, prototype Lancaster, which was really just a Manchester with four Merlins instead of two um, vultures uh, with six feet on each winter. Um, some of them had three rudders. But uh, almost uh, at the same time, the Manchesters adopted two rudders too. So the, the aircraft looked exactly the same, except for a slightly longer wing tip, uh, wingspan, and uh, the four engines. And name, my namesake, and uh, the family of Halifax machines. I wish. This aircraft and all her sisters, Godspeed and success and good luck to their gallant crews. The Handley Page Halifax was the third four-engined heavy bomber to enter service its first operation being flown in March 1941. The Halifax was hampered in the early days of its career by a relatively low operational ceiling, which resulted in high casualty rates. But it was a rugged design, enabling it to absorb heavy battle damage. It was a major difference. Flying controls were so much lighter. Uh, I have said before that Halifax, compared to Whitley, was almost like a flying fighter or single, single engine aircraft. Um, it, it was quite manoeuvrable. It, it had very few bad faults as far as I was concerned. As long as you treated it with respect, it, uh, it handled quite well. It, it did have one inbuilt, the, the, Mark, the Mark 1s and 2s did have an inbuilt problem with um, um, rudd surfaces uh, and it was possible to get into a spin situation uh, over the, if you're throwing a target, throwing the aircraft around it over the target and uh, I have one friend who actually got one inverted one night and brought it back not with all his crew he bailed some of them because he didn't think they were going to make it Bent the main spar and... Well, I think it was... Um, it was as cramped as a Wellington. Um, I mean, I had a navigation compartment not much bigger than this, uh, sitting sideways on with, with um, cathode ray tubes and, and equipment all around me, um, a relatively little space for my chart. Um, if the bomb aimer needed to get through into the into the front compartment I had to had to get up and he had to squeeze his way past me um, it was cramped um, but um, no I, I I didn't find uh, I didn't find it a difficult environment um, it was the availability of all the other bits and pieces and the boxes and what the boxes could do for me that that improved the environment significantly um, I mean, I think every air crew member had a great love of his own type of aircraft, a Halifax man, a Lancaster man, um, and despite the limitations of the Sterling, for example, 
um, a navigator or a crew member on a Sterling would have a great respect for his aircraft and a great love of his aircraft. Um, and um, certainly that applied as far as my view of the Halifax. Yeah. Now I like the Halifax, it was a tough aircraft. Um, it had the had a disadvantage that um, takeoff and landing, I, I had to leave my position and, and go back um, part way down the aircraft for a, a safer crash position in case things went wrong. Um, but once one was airborne, I'd scuttle forward and down the steps and uh, sit there and I had curtains drawn either side to keep the, keep, A, keep the light of my equipment from shining out. Uh, it also meant that I couldn't see what was going on outside. <laughs> the Nazis entered this war under the rather childish delusion that they were going to bomb everybody else and nobody was going to bomb them. After Rotterdam, London, Warsaw, and half a hundred other places, they put that rather man theory into operation. They saved the wind, and now, in February 1942, Air Marshal Sir Arthur Harris took over at the helm of Bomber Command. There comes a moment in a war where a nation has to accept the fact that unless it changes its attitude, it's going to lose the war. And Harris um, was this, realized very, uh, very early on that, uh, that we weren't really going anywhere. He was in, in, um, in America basically part of a buying mission, talking to the combined chiefs. I don't think um, he did a lot of listening. Harris was a great guy for, he had opinions, right or wrong. But he, when he took over Bomber Command, he got a grip on that force. And that's the first thing he had, a tremendous grip. He said, we're not mucking about anymore. We're going to wreck Germany from end to end. We're not in the import and export of bombs business. We're not taking them out to bring them back. And it sent such a shockwave through the command that uh, to this day, you'll talk to the veterans and, and they can remember it, that at long last, we've got someone at the top who's going to fight our corner with the air staff and the Ministry of Aircraft Production and the boffins to get us the kit. And um, at the same time, he's going to send us out in, uh, in mass. We're going to achieve something. And he did that uh, two months after he took up the command with the thousand bomber raid against Cologne, which, I mean, it, it didn't achieve a great deal, but my word, did it make the headlines. It put Bomber Command right on the map. I think, again, speaking personally, for, from the start of uh, Bomber Harris being in charge, there was a very different attitude. Um, the squadron, well, my squadron, certainly uh, were make, making a greater effort, and perhaps this was partly because we'd just come on stream from convert on conversion uh, onto the Halifax, but um, there was a, seemed to be a greater keenness. We felt that Butch would try as best he could to minimise losses. He was very careful with routings and uh, weather and things like that. But um, the harder-nosed people, one who I mentioned a little while ago, told their crews at, at one briefing that uh, he would sooner lose 50 aircraft tonight and destroy the target and not have to go back night after night after night losing perhaps 50 and not destroying it. Uh, so there's a, a difference of uh, hardness there to be able to say that to a room full of crews and say, uh, as soon as you, none of you came back, as long as we. Harris was determined to see Bomber Command make its impact on the war effort. And in the spring of 1942, the Thousand Plan began to take shape. Every bomber that could fly was prepared for action. Even aircraft and crews from operational training units were thrown into what was, after all, an enormous gamble. 
Failure would mean the end of Bomber Command and the end, or at least a dramatic scaling down, of the strategic bombing campaign against Germany. The Thousand Bomber Raid was um, the turning point in the Bomber War, Ar arguably. It's certainly what I would argue. For a start, a thousand bombers. Now, that's, that's not nickels and dimes anymore. That's an enormous force. No other air force in the world has ever put up a thousand aircraft on one single operation. And um, the reports came back of this whole city having been wrecked. From one, It wasn't, but it got a fair knock. They got a fair knock in against, against Cologne. It made wonderful headlines. No one could really argue from that point on that the bomber force wasn't doing something. And an awful lot of the, what should we call it, backstabbing and backbiting stopped after the Thousand Bomber Raid. The, the, the change of attitude, uh, I think, was demonstrated particularly at briefing. As soon as um, it was announced what the target was and what the raid was to be, and that it was there would be a thousand aircraft on stream, it um, became very apparent that it was a new approach, uh, and I think it was a great, greater keenness on that particular night. And when we taxied out on takeoff, uh, ground crew and station administration staff were lining the runways because by that time news of there was something special on. I hope the target wasn't common knowledge. I was actually on target um, 65 minutes after the first aircraft uh, with a mixed bomb load of incendiaries and high explosives. So um, as I approached the land, uh, I could see the fires, the glow of the fires. My first impression actually was that it was the moon rising. Um, but of course, it was glowing fires, and one could see that scene crossing the Dutch coast. That was a fantastic scene. And once the nearer one got to Cologne, of course, it became more obvious. Uh, and again, I stood around over the tunnel. Um, my initial impression, frankly, was a futility of what was happening. Um, but I have to confess that uh, I had a flashback to the situation in London. My first leave from the Air Force in 1940 was at Christmas. And I'd come through the tube stations, seeing the people in the big used as enemy shelters with the people sleeping on the platforms. And it gave me the determination to do something about it. The 1000 bomber raid was certainly not the last large scale attack. Larger formations would bomb Germany repeatedly over the next three years, sometimes attacking targets a lot further away than the Ruhr. Jim, that's, yeah, that was a long one. I think it was 10 hours and 10 minutes, and we ended up in Manston with. Um, we were on three engines, and at times we were only on two, and we'd had a tussle with the fighter on the way back. So, but that was a long one, yeah. But on the other hand, there's a friend of mine who sadly um, was on the Chemnitz operation as his first raid ever. And he should, I remember having words about that. I, I disagreed with my commanding officer on sending a new crew on such an operation. And he listened, but he didn't change. But today, there are those who still question the validity of the bombing campaign. Well, the first thing that surprised me was almost everything that the public believe about Harris and RAF Bomber Command isn't true. Uh, Harris did not uh, destroy the city of Dresden because of personal pique. Uh, he didn't start the area bombing offensive. The RAF Bomber Command air crews were not war criminals or terror flyers. It was um, a necessary act in the middle of a world war, and it contributed in a very large way to Allied victory. So I came out of it uh, fully convinced that they had a story to tell, that they had been grossly misjudged by history in the last 50 years. The bomber in the Second World War changed the nature of war. Civilians, thousands of miles apart, 
became part of the front line. And unpalatable though it may be, this was the consequence of waging total war. It taught our leaders to think again about the nature of conflict. But the price of this lesson had been high. Some 55,000 men in Bomber Command alone became casualties, almost the highest in any armed service. And they should not be forgotten. We had a job to do. And that job was to win the war. No, no time for wondering whether innocent people were, were being killed at the same time. After all, many innocent people killed during the Blitz and uh, in, in the concentration camps, etc., etc. No, I don't think uh, we were worried at all. I feel very bitter about it, frankly. I can't help but think of 55,500 young men who were killed in Bonn. And, um, and obviously some of those are friends. Um, there were 10,000 prisoners, 9,000 who were wounded, um, got back to this country wounded. Um, and that's a shocking waste.